Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Today, we're responding to Ashley Keaton's 10 Questions for Atheists in 2022. In my experience, whenever Christians have questions for atheists, there tends to be a lot of erroneous assumptions being made about atheists and the atheistic position in general, as well as a lot of the same questions that get asked almost every time. But hopefully, there will be something unique to respond to, or at the very least, no straw manning of non-believers and a genuine attempt at civil engagement. So, take it away, Ashley. I have ten questions for... Atheists, agnostics, and people who believe in a higher power but don't, for some reason, want to call it God. Here we go. First question. Does objective evil exist? I would say no. The word evil itself is a value judgment and as such is definitively subjective. Value can only be assigned by a subject. So then, in effect, what you're asking is, is there such a thing as objective subjectivity? And that's just nonsense. It violates the law of non-contradiction. The idea of objective morality put forth by Christians is dependent on special pleading about God somehow not being a subject. Even if there is a God, and that God has set moral law about what is good and evil, it is still subjective because God himself would be the subject interpreting right and wrong. In a universe devoid of life, with no thinking agent to classify events, then nothing that happens could ever be labeled as good or evil. If a star in that lifeless universe went supernova and destroyed dozens of planets, it isn't good or evil, it's just something that happened. Totally absent of value attached to it. In order for anything to be labeled as evil, it requires some subject, some thinking agent, to label it as such. That makes it automatically and irrevocably subjective. Number two, can you define objective evil for me? Well, I feel I gave a fairly comprehensive explanation of it in my answer to question one, but to give a more concise definition, objective evil would be actions or occurrences that are negatively impactful and are not subject to interpretation or evaluation by any thinking agent. Since there would need to be a thinking agent to assert that such action or occurrence is indeed negatively impactful, it automatically requires evaluation by a thinking agent and is thus self-contradictory. Number three, and this one's my favorite, have you ever honestly tried Jesus? He's all right. We're not talking about the biblical text or Christians. Have you ever tried God out sincerely? And I'm not assuming that you haven't. I just want to hear different answers on this to see who has really tried Jesus out. Just to point out a bit of a category error that you just made, you started off asking if we've tried Jesus then rephrased to ask if we've tried God. I know in the belief of the Christian Trinity, the Father, God, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are all one. But there is a differentiation between God and Jesus. I mean, a Muslim would answer that yes, they've certainly tried God. But no, not so much with Jesus. But to the question, yes, I have tried Jesus and the Christian God. I was personally raised Catholic and was active in the church my whole life through my late 20s. Church every Sunday as well as Sunday school. I was a youth leader at a Bible camp for a time. More than that, I was a faithful believer in Jesus until around 30 years old or so when my crisis of faith pushed me to begin to consider myself an agnostic, which made me an atheist at that point, but I wasn't comfortable accepting the label of atheist until about five years later as I was still attempting to salvage my faith prior to that. But this seems to be a regular question that Christians pose to atheists, almost as if they think all or most atheists are lifelong, from-birth atheists. And if anyone would just give Christianity a try, they'd just absolutely fall in love with it and never leave. 
I know that you said you weren't assuming that atheists haven't tried Jesus. I'm just talking in general where there's questions posed from Christians here. In my experience within the atheist community, it's very much the opposite. Most atheists tend to come out of religion, and in Western society, that is most often out of Christianity. Number four, what would be, in your view, a better explanation for how the world came to be about? The Big Bang or God? What makes the most sense? logically, consistently, theoretically, cosmologically. For starters, that's a false dilemma fallacy. Not only because those may not be the only two options for the formation of the cosmos, but also because those two things are not mutually exclusive. Many modern Christians believe in the Big Bang, including many apologists, they just claim that it was God who caused the Big Bang. Back when I believed in God, that was certainly my position. Because after looking at the evidence for the Big Bang theory, there was no rational way that I could deny it. Like any scientific theory, it's the prevailing model with mountains of data, experimentation, observation, and calculation that all point to its validity so strongly, it just can't be discounted. Also, you asked if the Big Bang or God were the better explanation for the formation of our world. Well, the Big Bang didn't specifically create our world. It can be viewed as setting into motion the expansion of the universe, which therein, billions of years later, would have the right conditions for the formation of our world. And in that regard, yes, the Big Bang is a significantly better explanation for how our world came about than the Christian God. Because the Bible, the supposed inerrant word of God, attempts to explain exactly how God went about creating the earth, and it gets it severely wrong. The Bible had God creating the earth before the sun, and that the sun and the moon were created at the same time, and the moon being its own light source instead of reflecting sunlight, and the earth being created before all the stars in the night sky and the earth being covered with water upon its creation until God separated it from the land. All of this we know. We know conclusively that it's wrong. None of this is how it happened. So no, God, especially the Christian God as laid out in the Bible, is a thoroughly debunked explanation for how our world got here. Number five, is believing in God an inconsistent view or do you just not like it? Inconsistent with what? Inconsistent with logic, rationality, and reason? In my estimation, I would say yes. But many people would say it's completely consistent with their conception of logic, rationality, and reason. And therein lies the debate. The great theological disagreement that's been going on for about as long as we've existed as a species. Because logic, rationality, and reason are open to interpretation. There will always be disagreements as to what exactly is inconsistent with them and what isn't. But in my view, the notion of a tri-omni God is inconsistent with logic. You can't have a God that's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in a world that is as imperfect and allows such suffering as ours does. If he has the power and the knowledge of how to make the world perfect and doesn't, then he must not have the desire and thus is not all good. If he has the desire and the knowledge of how to make the world perfect and doesn't, then he must not have the power. And if he has the power and desire to make the world perfect and doesn't, then he must not know how. Then there's the aforementioned impossibility of objective morality, even if dictated by a god it is by definition subjective. The also aforementioned glaring errors contained within the Bible, of which we have only chipped the surface of everything that is wrong, both factually and ethically, with the Bible. All of this, and many, many more reasons too numerous to go into here, are just some of the reasons I find belief in God to be inconsistent. Now, as to the notion of whether or not I just don't like it, as I previously mentioned, I was a faithful Christian for the majority of my life. And when I went through my crisis of faith and ultimate deconversion, 
It was a long, slow, and at times emotionally and psychologically taxing process. And it was precisely because I so wanted God to exist and wanted my Christian faith to be true. In the years between first starting to doubt my faith and my eventual accepting of atheism, I sought out all the arguments in favor of God that I could in an effort to find reasons to continue to believe in God because I wanted to salvage my faith. And every argument I heard, every apologist reasoning I encountered, was just the most cursory of critical examinations. I found them all to be based on fallacious reasoning and illogical assumptions. It was my attempt to save my faith that ultimately ended it entirely. So no, it wasn't that I just didn't like it. It was that I cared more about what was actually true, or more accurately comported with reality, than I did about what I wanted to be true. Number six, do all humans understand morality the same way? And some just choose to act against that good morality? I really feel this has been dealt with before in questions one and two. No, all humans do not understand morality in the same way. Morality is necessarily subjective. The notion that everyone has the same moral understanding and some just choose to act against it is not supported by any historical, sociological, or psychological evidence. Cultural anthropology shows us monumental differences in how ancient cultures viewed right and wrong and how they did things that we would find abhorrent today. Ancient Spartans threw infant children who were too small or sickly off of cliffs so they wouldn't weaken society as a whole. Today, the idea of doing such a thing, even to a severely ill infant born with significant birth defects that will likely result in the infant's death within days or weeks, is so disgusting to us as to turn the stomachs of many people at the mere thought of it. The brutal, merciless slaughter of a society's enemies, the torturous punishment and death of criminal offenders, slavery, genocide, sexual conquest and oppression, to name but a few things that we hold to be despicable now, but everything we know tells us that not only were they practiced, normalized and accepted, but often celebrated and venerated. And not even in the distant past that we so often like to separate ourselves from. But much of what I just mentioned is contained in some dark corners of the Bible that Christians like to ignore and pretend don't exist. The idea that everyone has the same moral framework and some people just choose not to follow it, fully knowing that what they are doing is wrong, is completely at odds with all the historical and modern evidence that shows people doing any number of things we in our society would classify as grossly immoral and doing so with gusto. You can't make the assertion that they all knew what they were doing was wrong. You can't prove that. It's just a post hoc rationalization to attempt to validate your idea of objective morality. And number seven, how can we know who is right? How can we possibly know who has the correct answer? Do you mean the correct answer as to whether or not God exists? Well, any question about how we know things is a question of epistemology. And that is another philosophical question that humans have been kicking around since day one. But I would say one good way to tell is, when someone makes a claim of truth, if that claim can be investigated and can be determined conclusively, that the claim is factually incorrect, then they can be said to be wrong. Right, that makes sense. If I were to say Billy left the front door open, but there's video evidence of Tommy leaving the door open, I've been proven wrong. Okay, well, the reality is that every time Christianity has made factual claims that are at odds with scientific ones, the Christian claims have been found to be wrong and the scientific ones found to be right. The aforementioned questions of cosmology being just some of them. This is where the notion of God of the gaps comes from. As our scientific understanding of the natural world grows, we find more and more things that used to be explained by God using his God magic to do things as being untrue. Whether that's the earth being only 6,000 years old, or a global flood killing everything except for what was on Noah's Ark, 
or humanity being created from Adam and Eve and not the result of evolution. As science progresses, they were all found to be false, and the gaps that God could possibly dwell in grew ever smaller. So in short, how can we know who's right? Well, we take the individual claims and we examine them insofar as we're able and determine if those claims comport with reality. And to date, Christianity's track record is not looking very good. Number eight, and I know the answer to this question, but I want to know your answer. Does the Bible speak for every person who calls themselves a Christian? Let me explain. You have certain people that act ungodly, in my view, and do some things that I would say God never told them to do, that say they are Christian, that believe in the Bible. There was actually something brought up the last time I did 10 Questions for Atheists, and someone responded, and they said that all, you know, a lot of Christians worked with Hitler, and, you know, a lot of Catholics, and ah, la, 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 la. those are not Christians. But that's my view. What would you say? <sighs> Let me calm down. <laughs> Does the Bible speak for every single Christian? Does every Christian represent the Bible? Certainly not. I wouldn't even say that every Christian is beholden to their own specific interpretation of what the Bible says. There are some people who call themselves Christian who intentionally and deliberately go against what they believe the Bible professes. And that could be for any number of reasons. Could be personal desire overriding their better judgment, a stronger attachment to sociological concerns than religious concerns, or could be political or cultural affiliations at odds with their Christian understanding. But also, let's not get into a no-true-Scotsman fallacy. You don't get to decide definitively who is and isn't a Christian. You can determine what you consider to be a Christian or not, but you don't get to make that decision for others. If someone calls themselves a Christian and professes to believe in the Christian faith, whether you like how they display or act on their faith or not, they are a Christian. But no, ultimately not every Christian is beholden to their interpretation of the Bible. However, the Christian faith in general is inextricably linked to the Bible and what it says. See, those are two very separate things. There's the faith and its practitioners. There may be plenty of Christians who don't believe everything that the Bible says and believe that the Bible is wrong on certain points, and that's fine. But the faith itself has, as a cornerstone of it, that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. So when the Bible gets things wrong, so too is the Christian faith in general wrong. 9. Is murder against the innocent wrong? And why? And we're back to another moral question, trying to get back to establishing objective morality. Alright, is murder against the innocent wrong? Yes. According to my personal subjective morality, yes, murder against the innocent is wrong. To go further, according to my personal subjective morality, murder in general is wrong. We can take out the innocent bit of it. The premeditated, unlawful killing of a person, which is what murder is defined as, is wrong. I don't care if they're the most guilty, scummy monster who ever walked the earth. Again, that's according to my personal, subjective morality. As to why? Well, I believe our social cohesion, and therefore our success as a society, is dependent on respecting an ethical system of laws and rules of conduct. To violate these standards is what I would consider immoral as it damages that social cohesion and tarnishes our social fabric. This can lead to more harm than good in a variety of ways. So that's why I personally would view it as wrong. Now, is the murder of an innocent objectively wrong? Is that the real question you're trying to ask? Because no, objectively no. Because again, in order to attach the value judgment of wrong to the action, it requires a subject, a thinking agent, to classify it as wrong, and is therefore necessarily subjective. Number 10, what is your confirmation and foundation for truth? My definition for truth would be that which can be determined to accurately comport with reality. Again, this seems to be an epistemological question, 
basically asking how do we know what we know? Well, there are two types of supposed truth, what we sometimes call in rhetorical criticism capital T truth, which would be claims dealing with facts, and little t truth, which would be claims dealing with opinions. For capital T truth, or factual claims, my basis for truth would be best described as the scientific method. That's the best model we have to discover what is factually true or not. As for little t truth, or opinion claims, I don't believe there is an objective truth where opinions are concerned. Here again, if you're talking about something that requires a subject to assign value to something, it is subjective and therefore dependent on the individual. It is not objectively true. And as to the question of whether or not God exists, this is a question of capital T truth. It's a question of fact. Either God exists or God doesn't exist. We may not have the capacity to conclusively say one way or the other at present, because science may not be at the level to which it's equipped to definitively answer that question, but that doesn't mean that it becomes a pure question of opinion. People often blur the lines between fact and opinion whenever they don't have a conclusive knowledge of something. But a person who says, for instance, it's their opinion that Pluto is a planet is not just as valid as those who say it isn't. Their opinion on the matter is just wrong. And when it comes to theists and atheists, we all have our opinion about whether God exists, but some of us are just wrong. And in my assessment of the arguments and evidence, I find it most likely that theists, and in this case specifically Christians, are most likely wrong about God's existence. So there was Ashley Keaton's 10 questions for atheists. A lot of them seem to just revolve around two central themes, objective morality and epistemology. But there were some thought-provoking questions, and it seems they were asked honestly with a genuine curiosity for the atheistic viewpoint on them. And I always enjoy engaging in an open exchange of ideas. So good on you, Ashley. I appreciate the sincerity. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.